And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us straight out of Rookie Jet Studio, creator of the... of the... Yes, that is a motherfucking JoJo reference, known as Overarms, and now with now with the in development um, RPG of a ruined world, superhuman abilities, and big robots with gimmick zero, the one and only Corey Burns. How are you doing today, man? Doing great. How are you doing? I am do I am doing good. Um, it's technically a Tuesday, but it feels like a Monday. It does. <laughs> That's what you get for Memorial Day. Yeah. Um. Well, the, at least at least it's at least it's a holiday where I don't where I don't have to get completely drunk. Yeah. That and that's simply because I, that's simply because the rules the rules go I have to get drunk on St. Patrick's Day. Oh, is that how it goes? <laughs> That's how it goes, and that's the and that's how and that and I'm looking forward to when the parades to when the parade inevitably starts up again because I want to laugh at people who are in um, the wrong kind of weather appropriate clothing for St. Patty's. You know, somebody you know it's 40 degrees out, and somebody the only green thing they had in their wardrobe was a pair of bike shorts. <laughs> yeah. But now, when it comes, uh, I um. Now it's it's been a hot, it's been a hot minute since I had you on. It, like you like you said before we went live, it was way back in October that I had you on last. And yeah, I think so. When and um, with when that was going down, you were you were hot, you were um getting real close to the release of Overarms. I think it I think it was just a few weeks before it actually came out. And now that it's now that it's been out for a while, um. What would you say have been some of the learning experiences you've had releasing releasing that? Because I think I think that was your I think that was your first item out of Rookie Jet. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, the first thing that we had kickstarted. Um, that was also our first major release. So we had done a few things here and there. We had released a game called Red Giant, uh, the first English supplement to Ryutama, um, just little things and. So Overarms was the first big actual game that we released, and to answer your question, the number one thing that I would go into the next game's Kickstarter with is taking into consideration that Kickstarter is basically a second time, or a, a part-time job, essentially, or a full-time job, depending on you know how big your Kickstarter gets, because I wasn't expecting that number from the Kickstarter, you know, we pulled in about $40,000. And so we had a lot of people, I think it was like 1,500 or so backers. So, you know, people have questions, people want to know if they can change their pledge, you have to constantly market. I mean, it's, it's a lot of work. It's worth it in the end. But it's, it's definitely when you work a full time job already, and you're doing that on the side while also trying to wrap up a game, it is a lot of work. I mean, I was I was working till probably like three, four o'clock in the morning every single night for that month duration, and then getting up at eight o'clock in the morning. So nightmarish. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, I'm I'm not I'm not one to talk myself, given the given the fact that I don't that I don't sleep because I have to juggle all these different time zones. So right. But now, when it came to gimmick zero. Um, was this an idea that you had that you had in the back of your mind for a while, or was this something that just propped up um, during or after the development of Overarms? Yeah, so it was it was kind of something. You know, let me, let me kind of backpedal here for a second because uh, Overarms uses a unique system that I created and worked on for pr the duration of the actual development time of Overarms, and so when Overarms was completed. I'm like, wow, we can apply this, and we can apply the system to a lot of other things, and just tweak it slightly so that it's unique in its own regard. But we're also not reinventing the wheel by creating a new system for a game that may or may not need it. Mm -hmm. So 
uh, Gimmick Zero was actually supposed to be like a 20-page game. Um, and I think the quick start is double that, <laughs> at least. Yeah, it's 42 so, pages. Uh, yeah, so that ended up becoming it's a full-on game just because we... I realized that, you know, it's like... If I make this 20 pages, it's not going to play how I exactly want it to, so it's going to have to become a full-fledged game. <laughs> so... We're, we're, it might actually end up being a little bit bigger than Overarms at this point. All right, but e even with even with that, I'm get I'm guessing that people who cut their teeth with over with Overarms are going to be able to transition over to Gimmick Zero without too much issue. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, it uses a similar system. Um, it's the same system as Overarms with a few tweaks here and there. Uh, the game of Gimmick Zero kind of plays more like a boss rush with RPG elements. So instead of fighting, you know, small hordes of enemies and things like that, you're mostly focused on a big boss kind of creature. So in that game, it's like you have more dice to roll mm -hmm. than you would in overarms. You have more bonuses to apply. But the system translates really well from one to the other. Uh, a lot of people in the Discord server and on on the subreddits uh, that we control have been pretty pretty excited about it, and they've had you know little to no problem getting into the actual system. Yep. Now, one now um one of the things that immediately struck out with me with with Gimmick Zero is the list of inspirations and I'm cur I'm curious as to what e what exactly you drew from you drew from each because we have Bubblegum Crisis, Katana Zero, Mega Man Zero, Horizon Zero Dawn, I'm sensing a pattern here, <laughs> and yeah. Evangelion. Yeah. Um yeah, so th those will likely be retooled for the final release. Um you know, uh, first things first, the elephant in the room with all the zeros around. Uh, you know, I was thinking of a name for the game, and I'm like, well, you know, it's been inspired by all these games. I might as well just tack zero onto the title. <laughs> so <laughs> that worked pretty well. That's, you know, it's easy. Um, so, I, I mean, the influences are essentially this. I'm not going to go through each anime, t like, telling you exactly what I pulled out from them or anything like that. But I will tell you that it's... All those titles you just mentioned, mechanics from all of those, like, um, if, if you're familiar with Bubblegum Crisis, you know, oh, you yes. have the rumors, and so that was kind of an inspiration for the gimmicks, same thing for the enemies in Horizon Zero Dawn, kind of big robots that you're fighting against, same thing for Mega Man Zero, mm -hmm. uh, but also that entire cyberpunk dystopian uh, post-apocalyptic future that you know, almost all of those titles have in common. Uh, you know, that's where the main inspiration came from, was just creating something futuristic, dark, gritty, with a focus on fighting giant robots. Mm -hmm. um, now, I will... I will note that... I will note that I had a bit of a chuckle seeing Katana Zero in this, because that... Um, that's that's a game that I do th I do think deserves more love both for its gameplay and its soundtrack. Tana Zero rules. Yes, I love that game. Oh. <laughs> and while I like Mega Man Zero, um, there are moments where it doesn't like me back. <laughs> yeah, no, Mega Man Zero is a very 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 rough game. Uh, Anti Creates went nuts with that title, and it's probably some of the hardest Mega Man games in the series. Uh, so, I would I would say that they, the I would say that they slit that they slightly that they slightly dialed back on the dickishness with their project after that, which was um, Azure Striker Gunvolt. Love that too. Well, it also worked <laughs> on Mighty Number no. Nine, but we're not talking about that. that no, we don't like Mighty Number no. Nine. Um, that that does that doesn't exist in the temple. It never happened. Um, Inaf Inafune had had made no comeback attempt, and Comcept only made Yaiba, which nobody likes. <laughs> um, but given th given that, some something that I did find interesting is that while y while there were certainly while there were certainly archetypes within um, Overarms, it does. 
there, it does seem to there does seem to be a a um a bit a bit more of a streamlined approach with them and and almost and almost akin to more traditional classes compared to the compared to the double um setup that you had with um over arms right right so okay you can keep going sorry um, i didn't mean to interrupt you <laughs> um, i was just gonna, i was just going to add that a big part a big part of that is having essentially the war the warrior rogue and mage <laughs> set set up with um jason <laughs> yeah with the gunner switchblade and war and um swordsman right yeah so uh with those you know going from something like over arms where you have like a anima or stand or persona behind you um, that you can junction yourself with is a little bit more different when you start looking at a, you know, more true-to-heart cyberpunk-ish game. Mm -hmm. uh, so the way that that's handled in Gimmick Zero is that your your players in Gimmick Zero have a um, nano armor that they equip. And so you can actually get bonuses and uh, you can get bonuses from the nano armor Whereas with uh, over arms, you were obviously using your stand or anima, etc. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the the classes definitely take a more standard approach versus the anima types seen in over arms. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely you know I think easier for people to pick up and really understand what they're doing because of that kind of archetype. Sure, yeah. uh, if that's even the right word, but uh, <laughs> but. It, 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 it works. It, it definitely works for the medium that it is. I, I like the idea of, you know, um, I can't remember if Shadowrun did this or not, but they did, you know, something similar, essentially, where it's, like, in the future, and you have kind of, like, these Technomancer kind of people, and... Uh, Technomancer was something they introduced a bit later on, and it's been a very scub topic ever since. Yeah, yeah. Um, not super familiar with Shadowrun. It's just a little too crunchy for me. But uh, you'd probably like Shadowrun Anarchy then. Right on. But these these classes definitely, I feel like, just paint a better picture for the player rather than you know some because if you come from Bubblegum Crisis, you know, or even Mega Man Zero, classes may not be apparent to you. So if we restylize them, it could be a problematic for us versus just using the default kind of keyword classes that everybody's familiar with at this point when they're playing games. Yeah. Now, of course, now, um, given the, f I had noticed that, e that, um, the main thing, the main thing that each of the classes provide is the hit, is the hit die, which I'm get, which, I'm guessing in this case, hit die isn't isn't meaning what a lot of people think it means. It just means the die setup that you're going to be using when attacking, and a special ability. Correct. So your your hit die will actually be renamed uh, in the final version because we kind of figured that a people coming from D and D might get a little confused about this, thinking it's you know like their HP or something like that, rather than their actual you know damage die. So. Hit die definitely work for attacking and abilities as well. Mm -hmm. And when it comes now, when it comes to when it comes to advancement, um, is how similar or different is it going to be compared to advancement in overarms? There's definitely going to be some similarities. Um, like, like I said earlier, Gimmick Zero was supposed to be 20 pages, so uh, originally, you know, advancement wasn't even a thing in the game. So you can expect something over arms, except uh, in Gimmick Zero, you will get things called upgrades. Mm -hmm. And upgrades can be obtained just by completing missions for certain people, your company that you work for, or just by leveling up. And when you get those upgrades, you pick from a, a genuine list in the book mm -hmm. of different upgrades, or you can feel free to create your own as well, and uh, apply those to your characters. So upgrades kind of work like armor, in a sense, where it's like you can only have one upgrade for your right arm, one for your left arm, you know, maybe some lenses in your head that allow you to see infrared, 
different things like that that just give you a little bit of a boost, uh, not only narratively, but also mechanically. Yeah. Um, one thing that I found interesting that you, that you, get, that you decided to go with is, um, unlike in, oh, unlike in Overarms, um, like because you're still do, you're still doing the stat generation of um of a fix of affixing a die code to to each of the stats, but yes. HP is not HP is not one of those. Um, instead every instead forty is the magic number when it comes to health. Right, right. So this kind of made more sense because in over arms you can you can be fighting against like uh, other anima users. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so it puts you on more of a level playing field when you're doing that. But in this game, since it's more of, more so of a boss rush, you're going to be fighting enemies that have hundreds, if not thousands, of HP in the game. So when we look at the different stats you can roll as well, you have five different stats that you can actually junction in Gimmick Zero. Mm -hmm. So in Overarms, you couldn't junction the, the stats for your character, or the stats for your uh, anima by themselves, but you could junction them together. So in this game, you actually can junction your own stats together. So your strength and intellect can be junctioned, your dexterity and strength can be junctioned, uh, and that just means taking the two dice and rolling them together. Yeah. Now, when it comes to the when it comes to abil when it comes to ability design, obviously because of how freeform this game this game is. Um, people are going to be com coming up with their own abilities, especially especially given the advent of of, ga of games like, say, Warframe. Um, right. Which I I um I could see some people making some comparisons, especially especially with the idea of nanite armor. Um. What are some of the general? I know you had a text box, but I'd like you to go over some of the general do's and don'ts when it comes to a good abil a good idea for an ability, and a, and an idea that's a case of may want to rethink that. Yeah, so a a good ability, I think, no matter what, is always something that you can use creatively. Mm -hmm. So just like overarms, you can create these abilities and use them. Uh, during combat, outside of combat as well. So when I keep in mind creating an ability, I try to create something that is support, that can provide support for people while also providing some sort of combat benefit as well. So for instance, like a grapple arm, let's say, you can also, you know, you can shoot that down, you can get your friends out of, the, out of danger, you can bring things towards you, you can likely, you know, shoot yourself up onto a building, etc. There's a lot of actual support uses for it, but you can also use it to latch onto an enemy that might be trying to get away. You can use that to tie them up. There's just a lot of different use cases for it. And I'd say a, something like a bad ability would... I don't think there's really such thing as a bad ability. Um, mostly, you just want to talk to the GM and try not to create an ability that would be... Um, game breaking or cause issues for other players. Like, let's say if you have some AOE explosive ability that you're constantly using around your, you know, your so-called friends or party members, uh, that could that could obviously piss a lot of people off at the table. So you probably want to stray away from stuff like that. And everybody hates it when the wizard throws fireball in the middle of the fight. Right. No, that's nobody's friend. And hell, and hell, at some of my tables, that's that's punishable by having to drink the pain glass. <laughs> Nobody wants that. Either that or drink a bottle of bacon soda. Don't. Yeah. <laughs> um. Now, when it now, one of the things that one of the things that I had noticed is when it comes to when it comes to criticals. Um. The rule. The rule set. The rule set. It. The rule setup is. It's either if bo if both die max out or if both die roll as sixes. Um, out of curiosity, what was the reason for putting in the um, double six rule? So um, as you upgrade your die sizes through the advancement chart through your paragons, um, it becomes kind of it becomes harder to reach that critical. Uh, with, with bigger numbers, so it kind of benefits 
lower numbers more than it does higher numbers. So if I'm rolling two D12s, right, mm -hmm. that's going to be harder to get a max value on two of them than it might be for two D4s. So the sixes are kind of there to alleviate some of that uh, issue as well. So when you roll, you now have two ways to get a critical. You have either the two sixes, which are nice middle ground between all those die, mm -hmm. or you just you roll max value on both. Yeah. So it seemed like an easy solution. It was uh, it felt like it was kind of punishing characters for uh, maxing out two of their values. But you also have to kind of take into consideration that from a narrative sense or a role play sense in the game, you know, the more the more inexperienced you are with something, I feel like the less or the more likely you would be to get a critical because you're just kind of swinging away your weapon. You don't really know what you're doing. But as you advance and you get better, you you kind of come into your own and you're more you're doing more damage overall, but you're less likely to get a critical because you, you already know what you're doing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now when it comes to now when it comes to the give now even though there's a few examples on on a bill on abilities and and potential upgrades, I'm guessing that you're I'm guessing that you're planning on at on adding a full on list instead of just a handful. Yeah, yeah, we want to update that list as time goes on. Um, what ends up being there might vary, mm. but uh, we definitely plan on adding more examples, and if we don't add them there, there might be a list in the back of the book that you could reference. Um, but one thing that I wish that we would have done, looking back on Overarms, is one of the biggest complaints we get is people want more lists of abilities. They want more stuff to work with, um, instead of kind of at least that they can build off of you know what i'm saying yeah so that's one thing we're trying to correct going forward in gimmick zero is by providing people with a plethora of abilities or at least ideas that they can kind of build off of so that they're not starting from ground zero with no inspiration mm -hmm. now when it now when it comes to abilities um just just as a whole is there is there a cap as far as how many abilities someone can feasibly carry? Um, I believe I don't have the book right in front of me. I believe it's two or three abilities right now. I don't think that's going to increase whatsoever. Um, we're trying to keep it because let me let me kind of backpedal here. Uh, abilities, I, I believe it's two in gimmick zero, but somebody feel free to correct me and a few months when the game actually comes out. <laughs> so, um, the abilities in Gimmick Zero are very, very similar to Overarms, but they are kind of changed a little bit. Uh, we recently started implementing something in Gimmick Zero called the Overheat Gauge. So, I won't go into complete detail about that right now since we're still working on it, but it's an optional set of rules you can use if you want to kind of limit your player's ability usage so that they have to maintain a balance of not using their ability every turn, but using it when it's appropriate so that they do not overheat. Mm -hmm. uh, when you overheat, your die values go down, uh, lots of negative stuff happens to you, or you can purposely overheat yourself and actually deal, you know, one big good chunk of damage to the enemy uh, instead of, you know, trying to balance your your heat gauge. Yeah. So there's there's a lot of difference. There's there's a lot of stuff we're working on, but there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, promise coming out with that mechanic as well. So you'll be able to carry around two abilities, and you just want to make sure that you're not going to overheat with them. And if you do. You want to do a lot of damage with it. <laughs> now, speaking of that, because unless I'm mistaken, I didn't see any mention of of a heat mechanic in the right. quick start. That's um, correct. I'd like you to go. I'd like you to go into that in the mind and the mindset for creating that particular control. How how is heat going to work? So essentially, uh, you know, right now in the in the, like in the quick start, there is no overheat 
gauge. So what we're planning on having, and we worked on this after we actually published the quick start, is that you have a gauge of one through six, and you are always at one. Mm -hmm. Now, whenever you use your ability, you add a counter to your heat gauge. So if that heat gauge reaches, uh, you know, one through six, or if it reaches six at the end of this, then you overheat. You cannot use your abilities until that counter goes back down to one. Now, with that with that kind of setup, um, how would you, how would you reduce heat just just by just by pa just passively? Yeah, passively. You just wouldn't want to use your abilities. It's kind of meant to mitigate players' usage of relying on their abilities instead of their. Uh, you know, load out their nano armor as is, and their creativity in a sense. Um, could, so, could it would it be feasible to say that an ability and a mechanic like heat could is also useful for reducing the nova factor that can sometimes happen? I'm not sure what you mean. Um, in parlance, nova is what is um when is when somebody try is when is when somebody tries to employ the strategy of dump, of dumping all of their big stuff at the at the boss in one, in one go. Yeah, I mean, you you can absolutely do that in a sense because if you purposefully overheat yourself, you can actually deal a lot more damage to the enemy, but you have to make sure that that's going to be the last hit you need because you suffer tremendously by overheating. I mean, it's if you get hit you there's there's times where you could get hit one time after overheating and that will be the end of your character. So the, yeah. even with that it does it does sound like there's there are certain reasons why somebody would try and push the edge when it comes to their when it comes to heat management. Yeah, absolutely. Some people are going to try to mitigate their abilities to keep that heat gauge down. Mm -hmm. Some people are going to try to stay right in that cool zone, right in the middle, probably at like 3-4. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to have some people who are really pushing the envelope by having it sit at the highest it can be. And also trying to, you're going to have some people who are just going completely, uh, you know, aggressive and trying to overheat themselves so they can do 50 damage to the boss before anybody else. Yeah. In in a way is heat management kind of your answer to the uh, to the anima points that were that were the main limiter in overarms? Yeah, absolutely. You nailed it. So, in gimmick 0, we don't have anything like that. And in the quick start, you'll notice you can pretty much use your abilities whenever you want to. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of just for demo purposes. Um, we are keeping that in the full game too, but we're also adding the optional, you know, overheat mechanic that we've been talking about to mitigate people who are just going to rely solely on their abilities to get them by. Yeah. Now I do think that since a lot of the abilities are support based, it should it it um, rant, ability spamming probably won't happen as much, but. We, but you know, you know how it is when it comes when it comes to people wanting to find exploits. Right. Yeah. We we don't like a power gamer in these parts. <laughs> I'm not I'm not fo I'm not fond of that kind of power gamer, but I also know it's going to. I also know it's inevitable that it's going to happen, and I've done my fair share of crazy ass builds over the years, so it's not like I'm one to talk. Now. When it comes to now, when it came to the uh, when it came to the description of armors, it mentioned that some are some are um, cor some are corporately funded and some are and some are and some are privately owned. Mechanically, is there a difference between the two? Mechanically, no. Narratively, yes. Um, now. I suppose, you know, it just depends on how you're trying to run your game because you could you could kind of you could label yourself as this person who owns their own armor and they don't go through a corporation or any you know rental service or anything like that and they've loaded themselves out with upgrades and things like that or um you know you can have like just a basic company armor that doesn't have anything going for it that has its you know just the, its unique abilities and that's all yeah. so 
you can make it have mechanical differences, but uh, instinctively, no, they don't. They don't have any right off the bat. You would have to kind of plug that into the game yourself, which wouldn't be hard at all. You just have to imagine the story behind your characters and give reasons for it. Yeah. Now, I wanted to ask a bit about gimmicks. Yeah. Now, obviously, obviously, the gimmicks that are seen in the combat phase are meant to be the boss of that particular scene or act or even episode if someone structures their game like that. Correct. Um, given the fa given the fact that with a, with a lot of cases when people when people hear boss they're usually going to be thinking of one or maybe two big beefy enemies that they that they have to con that they have to contend with. Against a against a whole part against a whole party, and how do you make sure that that's still going to be a challenge? Well, uh, one of the things that gimmicks have working for them in the game is that they they usually have phases to them. So as you end up dealing damage to them, they unlock new abilities of their own, in which the GM can choose to use. Um, you know, some are dependent on when they reach a certain HP or below they automatically trigger an attack that circumvents everyone else's turns. Um, you know, it gets very, very classic, like, JRPG with some of these, where they have different phases. You can kind of attribute that to Mega Man Zero as well. Um, and then you get the just more narrative, sort of narratively-based combat, where you have all these different events taking place that the gimmick is kind of controlling during combat. So... You only have 40 HP unless you get an upgrade through leveling up, mm -hmm. you know, your company, etc. So that's a standard HP, and that can that can disappear really quick with just a few bad roll, rolls. So gimmicks will always be a challenge, and if anything, they could become too much of a challenge, I think. In, uh, in playtesting, have you had any instances of TPKs? No, not so far. Um, no total party kills. We've we've come incredibly close, but uh, you know it just it just depends on the players you're you're playing with. You know, do you want to do you want to actually create a total party kill for everybody, or do you want to make sure that everybody is having a good time with the characters that they're they've gotten used to and accustomed to? You want to give them. For me personally, I like to give my players the illusion of death. I might kill one or two off, but I I don't like to allow total party kills to happen in my games personally. Just because it's if we're you know let's say eight sessions deep into a game and all of a sudden it's a total party kill, it's okay, guys. We need to write a new story and roll some new characters, mm -hmm. and it's 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 kind of a demoralizer. Uh, it just it just doesn't doesn't sit well with me personally yeah. but but if you want to roll with gimmick zero like that you absolutely can you will kill your party many times over uh the scenarios in the book that will be included with it will be uh structured in a way to where you can run them as individual one shots which by all means kill away and if you want to you can even use them all as kind of a cohesive scenario mm -hmm. or campaign to play um, now, going further on the whole bo on the whole boss thing, like I said, with a lot, um, there's a couple questions that I have on that. One is prevalent to the fact that you brought up Mega Man Zero, and right. as somebody who as and you've probably played Mega Man games as much as much as I have, so the so the idea of aim for the weakness, the whole rock paper scissors thing, is probably drilled into your head. Um, how do, how does exploiting weaknesses carry out within um, gimmick zero so it's the weakness there is kind of a little bit of a weakness system but it's not tied to Mega Man like you would think it would be so every gimmick has a weak point on them and essentially you have to through trial and error or through Intel you've obtained um, yeah you know you can essentially find this weak point on a gimmick and exploit it. So whenever you attack a weak point, there's extra damage that you'll deal. Uh, when you look at some of the class skills, some of them actually deal more damage if you're attacking a weak point. 
And um, you know, you can customize your abilities that way. We might even have some upgrades that assist with locating weak points mm -hmm. or um, you know, things like that. So it's more of a streamlined system. It's not like you kill this gimmick, you pull a piece off of it, and then you can start, you know, dealing massive damage to this other gimmick. It's more so trial and error, or you need to find some sort of intel through the company files or through somebody who's encountered it mm -hmm. to find Point. Now, a lot of people, like I, like I said before, a lot of people, when they hear the term boss, they usually associate it with one big, beefy um, character. But within, right. the, within the book, do you have plans for, within the book as, you're, as it's developing, do you have plans for um, alternative interpretations of the idea of a, of a gimmick um, invol involving, involving multiple, let's say, tar let's say targets? One of the key thing, one of the things that comes to mind is the Watchers of the Abyss in um, Dark Souls 3, for instance. So there will be... I know of one gimmick that we have planned that will deploy these sort of drones that you'll also have to deal with as, like, a minor enemy. Um, when you say... So, I mean, in, in that situation, it's like, yes, there will be more enemies in combat uh, than just the gimmick itself. Mm -hmm. uh, Another thing that can actually happen in combat, too, is there are these things called aberrations that you could possibly run into as well. Mm -hmm. uh, there are also other gimmicks. You know, if two gimmicks appear in uh, the same spot and they're fighting against you, it's probably time to hop in and get out of there. So there will be some differences between them. Um, to kind of answer your question about the different interpretations of what a gimmick could be. It might take a little bit of work on the player's end, but they can absolutely use the game for anything they want. Mm -hmm. So you could turn gimmicks into, you know, I mean, you could technically turn a gimmick into a Shadow of the Colossus uh, Colossus, <laughs> and kind of run the game similar to that with a party if you really wanted to. Like a futuristic Shadow of the Colossus, I suppose. But um, yeah, that's that's basically where I stand on those. Now, give now. Um, the thing that I found interesting is that with your previous work, you had put it up on Kickstarter and then um, and then put it up on Drive Through RPG. Whereas right. with Gimmick Zero, you put up a early access version on Itch.io. Um, what was the reason for go for going with Itch instead of going with Kickstarter? Is it just to get feedback for an for an eventual Kickstarter um, release, or do you have something else planned? Well, the, we actually did put out a quick start rule for Overarms way before we took it to Kickstarter. All right. uh, so we used that to build a community around the game and get people's input on, you know, hey, do you like the direction this is going? Do Should we do something different? You know, what, what are we missing? Any spelling errors? Stuff like that. And that was really, really good for us because we were able to build a small community around... This quick start book, we gave people something to look forward to, and we were able to also use the community to fix issues with the book. So um, then we took Overarms to Kickstarter and funded the full book. That that gave us enough to do, you know, pretty much anything we wanted to with that book. And then we moved over to uh, supporting Overarms a little bit. More stuff's coming with that eventually. And then we started working on a few other games, one of those being Gimmick Zero. So with Gimmick Zero, we went ahead and did, kind of did it the same way, where we released a quick start to try to kind of build up a little community around it, get it a following. Mm -hmm. And then whenever we get it completed, or close to completion, I should say, we will take it to Kickstarter to finalize everything and actually <laughs> pay off some people. Yeah. Um with and I'm gu I'm guessing I'm guessing that um when it comes to the when it comes to the full size book you're prop I'm guessing you're shooting for around a hundred pages. Yeah, like I said earlier, it'll probably be a little bit over because we're including one thing we're doing with Gimmick Zero that's different than Overarms is we're including more scenarios. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how many there will be at this moment. Excuse me, but um. There will definitely be more overall text in the book. Uh, I think right now, 
from from my document from my memory uh <laughs> we're we're sitting at like 70 pages already so there's definitely going to be a little bit more content if not the same amount of content as over arms now when now um given given what you mentioned about the heat about the heat system not being in there yet i'm curious if you have if you have any plans to do a fu to do a future update on itch.io in the coming months, um, I mean, the quick start rulebook is finalized, so we won't. We more than likely will not be updating that unless it's just quality of life for people jumping into the game. Um, like if we change something pivotal inside the quick start document. Uh, that or inside the main document that would reflect on the quick start rule book where it would cause confusion if somebody read the quick start and then went to the main book we'd absolutely update it but we're not we i think i think that the quick start was like 40 50 pages so that's even bigger than the overarms quick start so i don't think there's any plans to actually uh you know, add more content to that by any means. The, the next big push will be the actual completed book that you can buy. And we also have that quick start rule book on drive through RPG as well. Mm -hmm. Now, give now, given that, given that, given that, um, Something, something I'm cu something I'm curious about is what is even though it's even though by core book standards it's still it's still going to be um it's still going to be relatively light. Um, yeah. Well, it's still I'm guessing it's I'm guessing you're still going to have it properly bookmarked and indexed, and I I know that seems obvious, but some pe but some people miss out on that, so it's one of those things I have to cut I have to cover. It's something I'm going to have to definitely bring up to my uh, <laughs> layout artist and let them know because uh, we, we definitely want, you know, like the character sheet to be form fillable. Uh, we want it to be as accessible as possible for people who need that. We would love to have printer friendly versions. Ultimately, everything just depends on how much time we have, how much money we have and how much support we ultimately get. All right. I get I can. I got gotcha. you. And. I'll cer I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how it how it turns out um, down down the road and if and event and eventually when it hits um, Kickstarter um, I'd imagine that's going to happen within the within um the within within the year at the earliest. Yeah, yeah, we're we're aiming right now. Um, you know, things have been crazy lately. We've had a lot of different projects in the works that we hope we get to announce soon. Uh, and there's just been a lot of stuff going on with COVID, you know, uh, we're still kind of, we're at the tail end of that, hopefully. And so we're aiming for a summer release date for Gimmick Zero. Um, now that's subject to change, but <laughs> that's, I'm going to try my best to get this thing out this summer. I got, I gotcha. So with with all that said, with all that said, I do want I do want to wish you the best of luck when the Kickstarter dr when the Kickstarter drops and a Absolutely. sincere thanks for um very braving the hell of time zones to come up to the temple and enjoy the insanity at play here. Yeah, absolutely, man. Thank you so much. My pleasure. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Leave the door open and crack me a beer, buddy. <laughs> oh, at the very, at the very least, you can be rest assured that we're not that we're not doing any of that Budweiser crap. Ugh. No king of beers for me, thank you. That king, <laughs> that crown is made of fucking plastic. <laughs> oh. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>